All right, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, somebody's gonna be coming up with a charger and interrupting at some point. But <clears throat> this is a comics journalism panel. Uh, most of you probably are here because you know what comics journalism is. Um, I would say that it's erupted in the last decade, the last few years especially. Um, my name is Matt Wars. I'm an editorial cartoonist and editor. I was running the site The Nib on Medium.com, where we published a lot of comics journalism, nonfiction essays, um, editorial cartoons, uh, all of which are kind of different, but you know, fit under a similar genre in that they're they're journalistic. They're about what's going on in the world. Um, we got three people here that are that do this stuff. Uh, I'm gonna just read their. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna be moderating. I'm gonna read their bios. They're gonna come up and do presentation, talk about their work, then we're gonna do a panel and a Q&A. So, uh, Peter Cooper, his illustrations and comics have appeared in magazines around the world, including Mad, where he's drawn Spy vs. Spy since 1997. And uh, he's the co-founder of World War III Illustrated, a political comics magazine now in its 36th year of publication, uh, which was really inspiring to me when I was coming up in this. And his most recent graphic novel, which he's gonna be talking about, is called Ruins which chronicles the migration of a monarch butterfly interwoven with a couple's journey to Mexico. Uh, Chris Kindred, <clears throat> down at the end, is a cartoonist and illustrator drawing in Richmond, Virginia. His body of work delves into themes of personal discovery, wonder, and sacrifice, and he just quit the army. <laughs> and then uh, Ted Rawl is a writer, editor, um, editorial cartoonist, and graphic novelist who has done uh, a number of books, including After We Kill You, We Will Welcome You Back as Honored Guest, Unembedded in Afghanistan, <clears throat> a title which I remember because I was on that trip with him, and his most recent book, Snowden, which is a graphic biography of Edward Snowden. So, It looks great on the little one, yeah. It, if you guys could see it, it looks yeah. just yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's a good, uh, it's a World War II cover. The colors and all these little pen lines. And, wow. <laughs> uh, are there any questions so far? <laughs> used, to be, <laughs> used to be working. Should not unplug this. <laughs> Surprise. Can we have questions, really? No. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, please. But yes, you. Can you each describe your kits? Like, you know, radio reporters have, like, Sorry. Right, it's when they're recruiting, can you go down the line and tell us, like, what you use, like, can you do tapes? Um, just, like, notes, like, do you have a kit with you in your first place? Oh, as in, like, what we carry whenever we go out on the field? Oh, as in, like, what we carry whenever we go out on the field? I guess for me, it depends on who I'm, uh, who or what I'm covering. Mm -hmm. Say, for the Baltimore Uprising, all I had with me was a uniball pen. Um, a tiny sketchbook and a slightly larger composition book with blank pages. And I thought I was going to like need watercolors and markers and all that, but I actually didn't need any of that. Um, oh, there we go. I had like one marker and it helped me through the whole uh, process. But then again, I also do courtroom sketches where I take a small uh, portable watercolor set with me and uh, an aqua brush and a pad and that's fine. I try to keep it minimal, mostly because I'm moving. But, well, Should we go to the... Yeah, let's talk more about that stuff. Before right. we run out of <laughs> juice, you mean? <laughs> yeah, right. I don't so know what's what that doing? means. So I, I didn't do that drawing. Uh -huh. oh, you're good, you're go. good. Just go up. Shall I just give a little... Can go up just and just hit that. Actually, since I can see it on the monitor, All right. I'm Here, good. Here. Oh, okay. Hey, help. There you go. There we Whoa. go. Um, so World War III is a magazine that uh, I started with my friend Seth Tabachman in 1979 when we were in art school. Uh, we both uh, came to New York and were, we were all ready to get into the underground comic scene just as it was collapsing. And uh, we were doing this work and we had done fanzines when we were growing up so the idea of self-publishing didn't seem so remote. So we um, just we published uh, this magazine including our own work but also people that we saw around sometimes on lampposts, sometimes around. In fact, I found, saw you on a wall and I 
called the number or whatever you had in PO box. Um, and um, the for a good time there was yeah for a good time <laughs> called Ted. It was in a bathroom stall. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, over the years, more and more people were kept coming to the magazine. So we're now in our thirty seventh years, 36 years, something like that, and uh, just had an, a big anthology published. But there's new issues that come out every year, and it's a, a rotating group of editors. That's just one piece of it. And we do a lot of comics journalism and have for a long time, a lot of times just talking about things that are going on in our own neighborhoods, and sometimes, like I lived in Mexico for a couple of years, and that turned into that. That's one of the my more illustration-y kinds of things that uh, I've done. Um, these days, uh, actually talking about environmental issues is the main thing I want to talk about because I think it kind of trumps pretty much everything. I shouldn't have said Trump, however. <laughs> uh, another example. I, I really like the wordless image. You know, I, I don't. I lean away from labels and things like that from the more traditional political cartoons, and I, uh, I'm just very interested in the wordless form and how it can communicate to people around the world and. Since I travel a lot, the idea of, you know, there's been occasions where I've actually drawn pictures to get the meal I wanted or whatever, but it's a really great uh, way to uh, get ideas to people who don't necessarily, don't have a common language with. Um, my most recent book, Ruins, uh, is based on the two years that I lived in Mexico. I went down there for uh, uh, a initially a sabbatical year. It was during the Bush era and after the second <coughs> election, as it were. Um, my wife and I wanted a break from that and also for our daughter to get a second language. And um, we went to this quaint little town in Mexico and um, it turned out that there was a uh, teacher strike that um, blew up into a major uh, international event when a um, uh, American journalist was killed. Oddly enough, the American journalist had done work for World War III um, and it was an issue I didn't edit, but when I when he was killed, I got all these responses from other people from World War III, a guy named Brad Will. Um, and so uh, we found ourselves in the midst of, of this uh, political event. In fact, at one point, it, we, I went down and I was drawing in my sketchbook of a, a, a rally, and my wife got tired of waiting around for me to finish my drawing. She's like, come on, I thought this was supposed to be a date. And so we headed out, and as we were leaving, literally, you know, we were getting to our car, uh, in a surprise move, the police attacked, and they rounded up about 150 people, and we managed to just miss that by a by a wisp. But um, uh, and uh, uh, entomology is another area that interests me, and I have incorporated that into the book, The Flight of the Monarch. Um, while we were there, we were raising monarch butterflies, and we ended up going to the monarch sanctuary and got to see this incredible millions and millions of monarchs in one place. And um, that's those are some images from that part of the book. So it's every other chapter comes back to the monarch and follows it going down, which is, again, this is all based on things that, that, I, um, that I had been aware of or seen or experienced, um, but I, this is a fictional account so that I can do the things that I want to and not be hamstrung by issues of you know, the exactitude of it. I can put the people dead in the middle of events. Um, and like I said, environmental issues are what are concerning me now, and this uh, was a way to fold that into the story. Yeah. Chris. Uh, hey guys, um, Chris Kindred, obviously, and um, yeah, uh, I, haven't been, uh, I haven't been a comics journalist for very long, but uh, I've gotten a great deal of experience um, in the roughly year that I've been doing it. Um, it started with a court case. What you see right now is from the Governor, Governor Bob McDonald trial. Uh, last year, he went to the United States, um, I want to say, he went to federal court over corruption charges, and um, I ended up being the, one of the courtroom sketch artists, one of three, um, the others being people representing CBS and NBC. And then there was me with uh, the dinky um, little like local paper. And um, it was pretty great. Um, it was a, a wild experience uh, just being in the courtroom. Um, yeah, just being in the courtroom and following the narrative that went by. Um, what I do, I like to catch the story. Um, I tell a lot of my stories uh, right in the middle of something. And this was 
uh, as far as themes go, right up my alley where I didn't really have any context of the case before the case started. And um, yeah, I came in in media's rest and figured it out and, um, well, I guess figured out the story and then was able to make images uh, based on the larger picture. So this was my favorite image, but um, a lot of it is through the paper site um, live coverage. And this is from the Baltimore Uprising. I ended up uh, being contacted by Matt uh, for the NIB to do some on the ground journalism uh, and interview people. And um, on one of the days <coughs> that I was down there, I ended up uh, at a rally and I caught this scene happening right now where there's a row of white sheriffs protecting the town hall. And there was one, he's the only black uh, sheriff among them. And all the white sheriffs are talking around this guy but this guy is totally quiet. And then um, that's when this uh, protester utters, utters like, if shit hits the fan, do you, do you have my back? Like, do you, are you gonna support us? So it's another story that I found myself like thrown into because this man had been questioning him and yelling, um, like yelling to the sheriff for a while before I even got there. And um, that, was, that was a lot of the energy that was at that protest. And um, oh yeah. As well as um, as well as people within the community telling like others or whether or not there were media or people visiting or people trying to know what's going on about what's happening about what the truth was um, just around Freddie Gray and what led up what other factors led up to something that caused Freddie Gray um, Freddie Gray's death. And this is more stuff. Um, this brothers walking to school or walking to that bus stop in front of a police line. Um, that was that was just a really harsh image. Um, I, I caught down there. And oh yeah, I also um, make work based on personal discovery. Um, this is a comic about masculinity, where um, it's framed. Uh, it's framed as a public sorting of thought about what masculinity means to me and also what it means to those within the black community because masculinity has a set, an almost like set way um, of being. And I know that's not true from what I see. There's so much diversity just within one group of uh, marginalized people. So I was commissioned to talk to a lot of people and these are folks, I knew locally and they gave me a great deal of feedback um a lot of these people really challenge the idea just in their daily lives just by being um challenge the idea of what it is to be um masculine or not be masculine or some some reject the idea entirely most don't think about it it's just uh hmm, how would i put it uh, one person put it as uh, masculinity was the boy box I was placed in. A poet said that. Um, so yeah, these are more images from it. Where they go in. Um, I know the one on the left is about uh, black. Yeah, black men loving themselves is inherently a political statement, and it's it's nuggets like that I find um, I find really really great to catch. So yeah. Did thanks. Hi. So, <clears throat> yeah, my uh, I've done um, graphics, uh, comics journalism for uh, pretty much since the uh, early since the mid 1990s, and uh, as Matt said, the most recent before this book was uh, the Afghanistan book. I've been to Afghanistan a few times, and um, <clears throat> that last book. Unfortunately, there's no imagery of it here, but it, if you could see it, it's really awesome, and. <laughs> So what we do have is some imagery from the Snowden book. Uh, this is, my publisher approached me about uh, doing a graphic novel biography, nonfiction, about Edward Snowden. And so uh, like all of my most popular books have been someone else's idea because I'm not too smart. And uh, so this one, um, th amazingly, it's the only biography of Edward Snowden at this point, even though the story is two years old. So um, I did not interview him. Uh, what happened is I, did not get permission to, to get an interview from him. 
And then uh, I, after I finished the book, uh, we sent the PDF through his lawyer, and his lawyer sent it to him. And so we got edits back from his lawyer and from him. So the book was kind of, ret it's a, so it's an unauthorized biography that's kind of retroactively Snowden approved. Uh, I start out in the book uh, referring to George Orwell's 1984 and the police state that's described in, in it. Uh, there's Orwell typing. Um, O'Brien watching every move you make uh, through the telescreen, which was a TV in everybody's apartments, that where the government could watch people in their most intimate uh, details of their lives. And, uh, and, and so this is just, the, these are more of those images. And uh, what's happened with Snowden is that he's shown that the NSA is, uh, has replicated um, Orwell's 1984 and then some. Uh, very few people, even, even two years after these revelations, are really aware of the full extent. Like, for example, um, they can, if you have a smart TV, you have a telescreen. The government does and can watch you in your, in your room, even if the TV is off, even if the TV is unplugged. Or, for example, if you have a cell phone, if you have a smartphone, they can turn on the mic in your room and listen to you even if the, the phone is turned off or even if the power has been completely drained or even if there's no signal. Um, they have the ability to turn on your computers in your, in your home and watch you. And one of the things that they like to do for fun, because a lot of NSA employees are young men, is watch people have sex and trade the videos of, of them. So this is the... This I is always point my... my Laptop camera at me when I'm having sex. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's it's always best that way. So uh, yeah. So the point is that like the 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 pro book kind of exp uses uh, graphics journalism techniques to explain these programs that are very complicated uh, if you read them. Um, so I'm trying to make it one program per page, uh, and then uh, talk a little bit about how the story broke. Here's the reporters from the Guardian t uh, talking about it. Here's a page that describes how all the data is transferred to an NSA data farm in Utah, and, and so on. And uh, you get the idea, and, uh, but you should really just buy the book. Okay. Yeah. All right, so yeah, one thing I wanted to ask you is, your new book is, is a fictionalized biography, correct? Mm -hmm. So, so why, why didn't you just do it as a straight autobiography? Um, I'd done a whole lot of autobiographical work, and my wife told me that that was getting really boring, uh, and that uh, I wanted to be able to uh, take characters that were an amalgamation of, of different people I knew and not have it be straight on with each of the characters who, in some cases, you know, for example, I wasn't, there was that one thing I described where we almost got caught, but I can mm -hmm. actually place my fictional characters dead in the middle of that. And when there was a, the journalist Brad Will was was killed, I can create a character that you get to know and and place him in uh, more into the, in the front lines that way. And it just gives me more wiggle room to not. I mean, I would I would be there's another book that I could do that would be that. And that um, I, I actually have another book called uh, Diario de Oaxaca that is much more of a chronicle of what went down and describes things and. Uh, as in a you know somewhat more journalistic, straight up way with all the details and the specifics and, and um, the the exact people, but this gave me a, a lot more freedom to to move around in that. Mm -hmm. So then, when you do something that's that's strictly journalistic, are you only drawing stuff that you that you witness firsthand? Because this kind of goes into like Ted's book, where he's he's after the fact, kind of you know recreating things. Well, it's, I mean that's more of a biography and. and you know, mm -hmm. I mean, you're not, you're talking about, you know, you're describing things that happen. I really like to do journalism where I am, you know, in, in the story and doing first person account. I um, was invited uh, to be a, an expert witness in um, a, a an obscenity trial in Florida uh, of uh, the cartoonist Mike Diana. And um, actually, I wasn't going to go because, I mean, I looked at his work and I was like, ooh, that is so horrible. But then um, I, the, the, the prosecution called me up and they started to depose me in that moment and I found myself arguing for art and what was and wasn't art and then I'll see you in Florida. Mm -hmm. And I did a comic strip about that and that 
you know, I got to have it be all real specific things. I mean, in general, like in World War III, for a while in the first uh, several issues, we were describing things that were based on information we were getting from the newspapers, or there was a distance between us and, and the information. And I really like that we, we turned in our third issue to talking about what was happening right outside our door and realized that talking about the, the, those specifics, it wasn't talking about Russia, say, in the, in mm -hmm. the Cold War, but there was a, a microcosm there that, that in, in some ways did describe what was going on <laughs> with, say, gentrification in New York City and, and how you know, the government was, actions were affecting people directly and you know, with personal stories. And mm -hmm. I think that that's, that's a, a really important aspect of journalism, this whole idea of you know, the, the news is, is constantly purporting to be this sort of m middle, middle of the road, we're just, you know, you know, we're not taking any sides, we're just, we're just showing you what it is, it is usually, uh, uh, you know, lying in some way, because they, uh, their balanced reporting is there's 100,000 protesters, and then there's like 20 people over here who are saying like, you know, my, you know all we are saying is give war a chance, and they show them, th you know, equally. Yeah, uh, everybody up here is pretty, well, Peter and Ted are, you know, explicitly have done editorial cartoons. I mean, Chris, what you're doing is, you know, I see sort of as an extension of that. Like, you're not trying to do some, like, objectively journalistic piece. You're trying to do something that's kind of, you know, to me, like, very raw and powerful. And what, so why are you doing what you're doing instead of dr doing fiction comics or funny strips or something else? Um, I kind of like the division between fiction and, um, and journalism in that I do my own fiction work where I, I can look to myself um, or count on myself to do uh, research that I generally, uh, that are closer to my interests, but um, as far as my journalism practice goes, I really like to be around the story and, uh, um, let's see. Yeah, I like to be around the story and I like to place myself um, as close to the situations as possible. Um, even in my daily life, I'm not not a voyeur. That's creepy, but uh, I, I <laughs> <laughs> he's he's watching the do the the telescope <laughs> cameras. Man. Yeah, I, I work for the NSA guys. Yeah. No, um, no, I'm an observer though. Um, I'm not the type to take over a crowd. I like to sit back, watch what's happening, and feel the energy. So whenever I do my journalism work, I kind of translate that over, and I I pretty much draw people when I'm chilling anyway. So um, that happens even if there's like a protest happening. So it was a really natural transition, even like to things like courtroom sketches or um, whether it's a courtroom sketch or a series of interviews. Um, it's just really closer to how I live and yeah. my fiction work is my escape. So Ted, uh, talk a little bit about the Afghanistan trip. So when you went, you weren't doing, and I when we went, because I was there with yeah. you. you. You weren't doing like formal interviews with the government. You certainly weren't covering the soldiers, which is like a, a main part of why you were doing what you were doing. But talk about why you did what you did in the way that you did and why comics. <clears throat> I'm generally interested in stories and approaches that are I don't see elsewhere. So like most people, I tend to follow conventional wisdom on most things, and that's why they're conventional wisdom. So I don't, <clears throat> so uh, what I noticed with the war in Afghanistan is that probably 90% plus of the coverage that was coming out of it since 2001 has been embedded reporters with the troops. And you really couldn't cover the war without that. You need those stories. But at the same time, uh, it seemed to me that uh, the stories of the Afghan people were being ignored. Uh, and partly, that's not really the fault of the press corps. Uh, people who work for major newspapers are not really allowed to do what Matt and I did, which is to go and hang out with ordinary Afghans and not be embedded and not have that protection. Uh, so uh, I took advantage of the fact that uh, no one will hire me on staff at a major newspaper and, uh, and, and, and used my independent status uh, and, and we went out and talked to ordinary people. Um, and I'm interested in how the war, in this story, how the war has affected people's lives um, for better and for worse and in other ways since, uh, the, nine, since uh, the invasion in October 2000, uh, 2001. So, the approach was to uh, to try to get those like esoteric, interesting, weird, um, 
viewpoints that bring you in close to uh, to stories that you just aren't going to hear anywhere else, like Matt and I went, uh, and Stephen Cloud, who was the other cartoonist who went with us, who's also a, a, a great cartoonist, um, did, uh, we, we, we broke fast during Ramadan with this guy who worked for the government uh, digging uh, and planning uh, irrigation canals and ditches for the for the Karzai government, but at night he was uh, he would he would help blow them up with the Taliban. So um, there's like sort of uh, you know these are the stories that are not that are nuanced and unusual, and that you're not going to get from CNN or NPR. So um, and I, and also in Afghanistan in particular, cartooning can be effective because uh, there's a prohibition culturally against photography of, of people. So you can, a lot of people will let you draw them uh, where they will not let you take their pictures. Um, so there's, you can, and also it's easier to sneak a drawing than it is to sneak a photo. So there's, there's a lot of good reasons to do it. I've always found that you can get more out of people or different things out of people when you're doing comics journalism and interviewing them, like when you don't have a camera on them or you're just drawing them and getting them to talk and say things. I mean, <clears throat> I, w I did some comics journalism in Haiti, and I was with a video team at the time. And, you know, it takes like 10 minutes, 10, 20 minutes to set up. You got lights on people, you're miking them. And when they're on, when they know they're being filmed, they're, they're on. And I am too. Like, when if they come up to me here at SPX with the, the camera and stuff, I'm trying to say something that I know will sound good. And, I, and I've always just found that people, it, especially because it's a novelty to a lot of people who don't follow this stuff closely, that they're real cool with it uh, m for the most part, and, and you can get stuff out of them that you wouldn't normally get. You um, I, oh, sorry. Yeah, to add to that, um, in my first interview in Baltimore, it started off as just a conversation. I'm like, oh shit, I should probably be drawing this. So I started drawing it, and um, it opens up a different level where the person, um, once they realize they're drawing you, they become either flattered or um, I usually ask permission or like break the conversation to ask permission, um, just in case anyone gets like terrified and runs away. But um, <laughs> they'll usually be flattered and then I have their trust and then it's just an open dialogue, a really a really flowing conversation and it's really great. It's a, yeah, it's a really great way to get people to talk. Um, I, I had a, um, uh, a combination experience in Mexico when I was there in 2006 during this teacher strike and um, my Spanish was terrible, and I went downtown where the teachers were encamped, and I stood on a corner and I started drawing the scene of this encampment. And at first, they, you know, people were like coming over. They sent the kids over to check out what I was doing, and then there was a point where then ad adults started coming over, and then they got really excited about what I was doing. And it took about, I, I was drawing there for about three hours, and uh, they eventually handed, gave me a chair, and it was, all, you know, all our conversation was just more, mostly pointing and without being able to bridge the language gap. So I, I felt this warm, but it was like literally hugging at the end of the, the drawing session. And I walked up the street, and there was another barricade, and I pulled out my camera, and I took a quick snapshot, and I got immediately surrounded by very angry, angry uh, um, strikers, and they wanted to take the camera and they, you know, and I was like, I had felt like I'd crossed some boundary with, because of all the drawing, but I'd actually, there's a big time factor that, that in a certain way, like a quick s snapshot is all, you know, it, you know, people do feel like it's stealing their souls. Part of it is that it required the time factor in doing a drawing requires an interaction and it gives them a chance to warm up to the idea and decide whether they want you to do it or not. And I mean, I've rarely been stopped from drawing Whereas photography, there is a, there, there'll be you know instantly people doing that thing, and uh, um, and I was able to draw in some places that again like photography would never have been allowed. But I was staying there drawing, and, and there was a church in uh, in a town called San Juan Chamula um, where it's very photography is forbidden. But they hadn't come up with a rule about drawing, and so they sort of hovered around like, oh well maybe eventually they said okay enough, but. Um, but still, it's you know, it, it, it's a way. Drawing has a way of rolling out a, a certain kind of communication carpet. Yeah, I think that's just because it's that it's that exchange of time. You know, it's like you're using time as a currency. So. There's also the magic of something that you know they're getting to see an actual a line appearing on the thing, whereas the camera is just all in, in totally in interior. I mean, Matt, Matt has a much more um, uh, realistic drawing style than I do, in other words, which is a way of saying he's more talented than I am. And uh, when we were in Afghanistan in Mazari Sharif, 
uh, at the Blue Mosque, uh, a, a pretty large crowd of people were gathering, watching us drawing. And I remember just watching the look in people's eyes as Matt was, was drawing some of them. And they, these are people who lived in a country where this was illegal, and they had never seen caricature ever in their lives. And, yeah. and, and Matt's drawing them for the first time. There's no mall caricatures there, you know? And, uh, <laughs> and it's, uh, so, so it was God. just magic to them. One of the great things about Afghanistan. <laughs> uh, how committed to accuracy are you guys when you do this stuff? I mean, so like Ted, in your book, you, you, I think you've said you, this is like a synthesized history of Snowden because you're, you're taking other sources, putting them together in a graphic biography. And you got scenes where it's like people at the N NSA or whatever. Right. You're so not there observing it, obviously. How, how are you deciding I what to portray and how accurate to be about it? Yeah, well, I mean, <clears throat> I'm definitely, uh, the Snowden book is as exactly as accurate as I can possibly make it. In other words, everything that I can, could find out about his life is in there, and everything that is that I could report is reported to the word. Um, but the, uh, but I rely on the fact that comics readers have a certain knowledge of how to read comics. So, for example, uh, if you see oh, President Obama in one scene saying, you know, uh, you know, what the hell is with this Snowden kid? You know, arrest him now. I assume that from the context, the readers know that he probably that I'm just supposing or putting words into his mouth and that he didn't really say that. And if you don't really understand that, there are footnotes and that wouldn't be footnoted. Whereas stuff that comes that is a direct quote from a speech or so on is in there and it's and that's footnoted. Do you quote the quotes and then I quote the quotes and I, I, I tr you know I think there's all the signals are there so that you know exactly what's real and what's not because you know there's things that you just can't you know it's kind of like you watch the movie The Longest Day about D-Day look we don't know what those Nazis said in their bunkers right but like you can guess and it's reasonable and the screenplay isn't a lie it's just trying to do the best they can. And I think in a lot of the time, if you're recreating events that you don't have direct quotes for, that's what you have to do as a cartoonist. Um, yeah, in my work, uh, specifically in my masculinity comic, while I take liberties sometimes with uh, likenesses or with my drawing style entirely by, say, reducing someone to a shape, um, accuracy is the most important thing because I touch on sens yeah, sensitive topics, and if I get one aspect of something wrong, I feel like I'm doing an injustice to the people I'm supposed to be representing. Like for the protesters, I didn't want to show, um, I didn't want to show everything nice and happy. The first time I went down there before I was contacted, um, we went with a journalist and he was like, yeah, we want to see people helping. We want to see people picking up after the riots. And I'm like, wait, but that's not an accurate portrayal of the anger and what's really happening down there. So when I went back down there, I'm like, okay, this is my chance to show how angry um, everyone is, and rightfully so, and this is also my chance to show the reason why people are angry. So um, I get to be as accurate with uh, taking the things and uh, taking the things that I see and juxtaposing them in a way that uh, exaggerates the accuracy in a way. Um, and the same goes when I'm covering ideas or situations like uh, when I was examining sexuality and uh, queerness. I didn't want to get any of that wrong because. I'm sorting out my thoughts, um, but I don't want to step on toes or misrepresent people. Like, there are straight men in that comic, but um, I don't want to misrepresent them, so, yeah. I mean, I think, I think there's a sort of a capital T truth that is more important than a lower T truth. For example, if you quote, if you interview someone and they um and ah uh and um and ah, uh, yeah. you know, you're doing them a disservice by quoting that. In, in, and, and it's kind of, uh, it, and it gets in the way of reading it. And what's the point of it? Take it out. It shouldn't be there, but it's not cop, it's not lower T truth. People always ask, you know, about how accurate this stuff is. And what, I, what I've learned working with and knowing colleagues who are photographers or writers or videographers or documentarians, I mean, you know, that, that stuff is so highly edited that, it, you know, you're watching a video of, some, of somebody you assume that there's no way that it, it can't be true. It obviously is literally true that they're sitting there speaking, but I mean, it, you know, you said a, a second ago something that you're, you're exaggerating a bit. And I mean, I don't even know that I agree with you. Like your stuff from Baltimore is not exaggerating, you know? I mean, it's, it's capturing something that's, 
you know, it's it's a it's a representation of what's happening, I and it's what, yeah. I guess what I meant with, by that was I will take the truth in this aspect. Say like one side, like what's happening with the police and them bearing down and uh, the residents and the protesters. Um, I guess the exaggeration comes yeah. in juxtaposing them directly because you don't see yeah, yeah, yeah. everything that happens <clears throat> in between it. So. Well, one thing I noticed, any time I know what happened in an event and I read the article in the paper about it, it's always got misinformation in it, every single time. And that usually includes, you know, say, my birthday or, you know, or when I did, I mean, if it's just talking about my own personal history, so it's not... It's not spelling your name. Spelling your name, whatever it is, it's just like making these connections. That, and that's virtually every article ever, right. which means all this news we're getting is it's gone through a filter to the, and it, there you have to be basically uh, assuming that it, that there's portions of it that are wrong we for, are forming opinions all the time I and mean, it's very hard to not uh, you know read something and then find yourself spouting some aspect of it but you could very easily be spouting something that is inaccurate it happens all the time we all do it as an editor I'm always asking myself like what is the prose equivalent of this so like one quick story is that a long time ago I was editing this piece, and I won't say the, the guy's name, but he drew this person that there was an interview with, and he drew him with glasses and a goatee, and I went and looked him up, and he didn't have that, but I mean, <laughs> you can grow a goatee or shave it off, and you can wear glasses or not, so I didn't think of anything about it until <clears throat> the interviewer, he was working with an interviewer, wrote me and was like, what is this dude doing? He keeps drawing this guy inaccurate. I've told him to change it and he won't do it. And I was like, what is what is the issue? And she's like, well, he doesn't have a goatee or glasses, never does. And he just drew it with that. With that. And so I was like, I wrote him and I was like, what <clears throat> What are you doing? You know. And he basically said, I think he looks better. I think he looks boring. And I wanted to add some features on it. <laughs> and it's like, <clears throat> I mean, I don't want to give any of us a bad name because it's like I, I haven't encountered anything on that level ever again. But I was like, oh, you don't get like what's happening, what we're doing at all. And, uh, it, you know, it, like doing that, drawing something that inaccurate purposefully is like the equivalent of, you know, you're writing a profile of someone in The New Yorker and you're like, oh, I was sitting on the panel with Ted Rawl and there he was with his mohawk. And in it, I just, I, he would be more interesting if he had a mohawk. I, I, that's that's true. Yeah. <laughs> that actually, that's one of those capital. Thank you for that. Truths, I'm, you know? I'm, yeah. I'm making an appointment tomorrow. Uh -huh. it, it, with the Snowden book, I that kind of came up with during the editing process because my editors noticed that his hair was parted on different sides throughout mm. the book, and uh, well, that's because Snowden changes the part of his hair, and which I think is really weird. Um, but. <laughs> But, and it's like, then I, it's like today I was talking actually to someone, people. and yeah, and apparently there are dudes, and this is a dude thing, where like they feel they, they need to like be balanced, and they don't want to like end up like me with one giant widow's peak on one side, so now you know. Mm -hmm. thing, I mean, even doing, the, um, <laughs> doing some, uh, can, can we you learn something every day. Speak, no. <laughs> this, is like the, this is like the debate, we're going to talk about hair. <laughs> Sorry, Matt. Um, uh, when I was doing ruins, um, one of the things, I, I have a lot of entomology in there, and I, one thing I knew I didn't want to have happen was that for an entomologist to come along and go, what, that's not the way that looks. And so I actually passed it by a couple of different entomologists. Yeah. And you know, there was the Latinates and all these different aspects of it. And I was like, that, that I know, if it falls on something of that sort, it's going gonna, it's gonna to really stink. And I also ran by other aspects of it um, with people I knew in Mexico, just to get a sense of like, how do you feel about this? You know, have I captured this or that? But, um, but it's really nice to have the freedom, though, to decide on some of the things that you feel are going to make a better story. You know, it's like reality sometimes, actually, it, aside from being boring, it seems inaccurate because it'll be like, you know, as if you run down and there's the train there or you like, I wonder what time it is. And you turn on the radio and they're saying or telling you the weather at that moment when you were wondering about it. That always seems fake in a movie. And yet it happens to us sometimes. So we have to adjust that and make to make it seem real some. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes it's, I mean, things are too real. Like, I did a book called My War with Brian, which is a memoir-ish uh, of, of be kind of like P uh, Peter's. It's a, it's a graphic novel, but it's based on my, things that happened to me in junior high school about being bullied. And, uh, th you know, when I started, I, my, my uh, editor said that we would make a lot more money if we sold it as a memoir. But the problem is if, it, if I crafted it as a memoir in chronological order, the story just wouldn't work right because the chronology was weird, and 
some of the things that happened were actually so crazy that I didn't think anyone would believe them, so I left them out of the story. So I had to like tamp it down because I thought reality was not credible. And uh, so there's, you know, it's just there's, it's so such a hard judgment call. And we did not market it as a memoir. We marketed it as a graphic novel. Uh, well, I ran into some trouble guys. with this very same thing where I did uh, a, basically my autobiography. But I had, I, I your life is boring, my, and yeah, my life is boring. It's, um, it, it's called Stop Forgetting to Remember, and I. Uh, I changed the names of other characters in this, and I'd done a lot of autobiographical comics, and I kept my name normally, but I changed it for this one because I felt like there, I, I have changed some truths here. I'm moving things around, and um, so, you know, I, I didn't want this to be, uh, uh, what was it, a million tiny pieces? What was that guy wrote about his yeah. so-called crack experience? So I didn't want to be accused of that, and, I, and so I made up a, you know, I had a doppelganger and um, that um, uh, a lot... A lot of people will say, well, is this true? Did this really happen because of this mild shift? And so when there was a French edition, I just made it my name. And, we got because And people were like, oh, of course, that's great. I think we got like 10 minutes left. but and, uh, So I wanted to open it up for some questions. But before I did that, I just kind of wanted to ask Chris, because you're like pretty new into uh, into this and younger than all of us. <laughs> and I'm just wondering like what, what kind of work you want to do. Like what are you drawn to? What do you want to do with this? Do you want to do graphic novels? Do you want to do... I mean, because you're, you're not getting into this because of the money. <laughs> uh, actually, that's a good point. Um, I, I'm into this. I'm into comics journalism because I ramble a lot on Twitter about uh, a lack of representation and just and racism and a, a lot of that stuff, stuff that I talk about with my friends. And um, I feel like there's a purpose, uh, there's a rewarding feeling knowing um, that what we talk about or that the things that people talk about not in public forum are made public, um, but not in such a way that reveals too much But um, about the people involved. But um, the work that I want to do, uh, I guess I would like to do more uh, editorial comics and more visual essays, um, as well as fiction work. But a lot of my fiction work ties into journalistic work because I pick uh, from reality a lot, a lot more than I thought I would initially. I, yeah, I grew up on so much fiction, but I'm starting to like nonfiction, and I'm letting that inform my work. So, um, yeah. Yeah, we got we got time for some questions. I think if I don't know what time we have to wrap up. There's one over here. First person I can think of is Ron Wimberly. He's here. He did a, a memoir. Was it a memoir? Um, but he did a graphic novel about a uh, rapper's life, and that was kind of one of my gateways into comics journalism. And also yeah, MF Grimm. Yeah, yeah. Sentences is what it's called. Uh, there's a, there's a ton of people doing this. I I feel you know I've published a lot of them at the Nib. And you could buy the Nib anthology and read a lot of uh, comics journalism stuff. But I mean, um, people like Susie Cagle is doing a lot of, uh, you know, I mean, she's a she's a reporter and uh, and an artist, and she does a lot of comics journalism. Uh, you know, Emmy Guinness, you know, Ron Wimberly's real good. Um, Jen Sorensen is doing a little bit at Fusion. Um, there's a lot. You, yeah, I mean, on World War III, a lot of the people that are working there are doing some form of comics journalism. Um, Seth Tabachman, who I co-founded it with, did a whole uh, book uh, called War in the Neighborhood um, that he moved into a squat in New York for a few years so he could do a book about the experience and, and, and talk about what was going on in the Lower East Side. Um, you'd be remiss not to mention Joe Sacco just because he's obviously, you know, he's managed to... Um, his visibility is huge, but he's also, you know, done a tremendous amount of work and really, you know, fantastic. You just reminded me. I actually did a when I was in high school. I actually did a paper on him and also some of your work, Matt. Oh, really? No, that, now you're making oh, me you're feel old. old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I used to be the young guy on the panel. <laughs> Fuck. Uh, my in terms of the question was about inspirations. For me, it would have to be Jules Pfeiffer, even though it's not really comics journalism. It's the fact that he was taking work directly from life and applying it through a political lens rather than just, for example, showing Nixon talking to Agnew, which he did too. But, uh, and I think uh, you, you t uh, Bill Malden's work, uh, the Willie and Joe comics from World War II, again, they're not comics journalism in the same way that we do it now, 
but it's an attempt to show reality on the front in a way that uh, you know war correspondents in comics form have been trying to do ever since. I think it, you you mentioned text journalists. You know, I mean, I probably read more nonfiction books than I do comics, honestly, which isn't a knock on comics. It's just how much I love nonfiction. So like the ideal book for me is like the big nonfiction book on like a big event. Like I just read Katrina by Gary Rivlin. That was good. And one of my favorites is Columbine by uh, Dave Cullen, which is like an excellent, you know, like my my ultimate ambition, if I ever have the time and is to like do something like a big, you know, the big Joe Sacco level Who wrote graphic that book, uh, the, cla- the Great Clash of Civilization, the, the Great War Between Civilizations. You talking about the Robert Fisk book? Yeah, yeah, Robert yeah. Fisk. That book, by the way, which nobody bought, like Robert Fisk's Great War be- Between Civilizations, is like probably the f- one of the three best books I've ever re- read. It's just insane. It's so good. It's like twelve hundred pages long, yeah. and you, you're sad it's over. Is uh, anybody else? You gotta have questions uh, up here. Yeah, uh, my girlfriend came to me like uh, after a class was ending, like, hey, uh, we have a friend going to Baltimore up. This was during the uprising, um, or like right when the rioting was starting. It was like, you want to go up there? And I'm like, yeah. And we um, linked up with a friend and took, uh, we just drove up there two hours away. And um, we got up there at night. We saw some of the demonstrations, got a good whiff of the tear gas. And while we were at a friend's place, um, crashing for the night, Matt uh, hit me up, and as we were going back, um, I was like, "Oh shit, I have to go back to Baltimore." So I bought a bus ticket and <laughs> caught a uh, caught a joint back up there, and um, yeah, that's kind of how I'm how I started comics journalism. So, by trade, I'm an editorial cartoonist, <coughs> si- you know, single or four panels, and uh, but in 1997, I got a job as a staff writer at POV Magazine, which is, doesn't exist anymore. And they, the editor w- told me one night, we just got $15 million. Can you help us spend it? And I said, sure, I can. So um, they commissioned me. And, and the, I would, had read Joe Sacco's work. And I just thought, wow, that stuff is just so cool. And there's things I would do a little differently. So I want to take my shot at it. So uh, that's, that, that's how it got started for me. Um, when I was six, my parents had me marching in downtown Cleveland against the Vietnam War. And a guy came up to me, and I had, you know, a big sign, something about LBJ, or I, I forget what it was, it showed the bomb. And uh, a guy came up and shook me and called me a red, and I was like, I have nothing red on, I have no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> um, but growing up through the Vietnam era and, and watching the news at night while we were having dinner made for a tremendous gallows humor in order to digest. And I think that, you know, Mad Magazine was actually hugely informative to me in order to understand that you could actually talk about these heavy duty things and then do it with humor, which f- just fascinated me. And they, they would then occasionally throw something in that wasn't funny whatsoever. And I would just be like, Ugh, there's like a soldier coming back from Vietnam holding a giant syringe because he's yeah. obviously a heroin addict. And it's like, what? That's th- where's the funny in it? But that gave me the sense of the possibility of doing that kind of work. And uh, um, But you know, nobody's like, like going, hey, come on! I mean, well, fifteen million dollars—that's a good, <laughs> that's a good moment. I, I that has—I haven't had a lot of those. No, nah, me neither. Um, but but just the you know, the thing Still that spurs waiting. you on is mostly I, I find comics to be so difficult to do. It takes so much time to do a work like this. This one took me three years, and I thought about it for five years before that. Um, that to do that all to have it just be like a fantasy or a a joke at the end. Just it's just. I, I wouldn't want to spend my time like that. And I also just, that sense of urgency that comes down from, um, I don't know, I saw a uh, fail safe when I was eight. And after that, it was like, the bomb is part of my life now. And the, and in a very positive way, weirdly, because it, um, it made me think like, I, I want to get this done before they drop the bomb. And I want to do that before they drop the bomb. I feel that way about climate change now. I mean, like, you know, before the wave hits, I, I have a book I want to do. And and uh, you know, so it, it's actually energizing. And anybody else? I just want to just add one quick thing to what Peter said. I mean, what Peter brought up is tangentially mm-hmm. is a very important issue in uh, affecting comics journalism. The ra- it is so hard to do a book of comics journalism, or you have to go somewhere, you have to report the story, you have to get funding to do this, and you have to have an outlet to put it out. 
These are these days. These are really high bars. And then the the pay that you get out of it is really relatively low. I mean, in a, cartooning is a low income profession. It's just but like comics, comics but worse. Pays comics journalism by the word or by the panel or by the day that you spend on it pays the worst. So it's that's why you're not seeing a lot of this work. There's not a lot of outlets. There's not, and it's just a lot of work. I mean, you know, people, in all seriousness, like publishers will say, oh, yeah, we'll give you a $4,000 advance. And you're like, for an entire book? Like, for a book? I mean, like, well, I mean, if I could do one a week, it would be great, but... Yeah, Peter, you know. let's not... Don't you don't have to reveal the, no, the no, advantage. No, I, I, I get paid so poorly for doing <laughs> some of these things. It's just like a miracle um, that I'm able to do. There's it. a question in the back that I wanted to hit up before this is over. Yeah, thanks. Um, is this? Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. Great. Uh, so, given the the types of uh, things that you're covering and the way that you're talking about them, it's clear that there's definitely an emotional response to to the experiences you're having. Uh, but I know that in journalism, there's an emphasis on just representing the facts and it, letting the viewer decide what they want to about it. So how do you reconcile the emotional response that you might be having with um, the way that you're rep representing uh, uh, your work? I have a pretty good example about this, uh, for this. Um, during the protests, um, yeah, during the uprising in Baltimore, I found myself wanting to demonstrate at some point, but there's the whole, uh, uh, the journalistic idea of impartial, um, impartiality, is that a word? Uh, just remaining impartial. and. Um, I kind of had to hold that back, but I'm like, because I have flexibility as a cartoonist, I can translate some of this work in what I do. So even if it doesn't show up um, in text or uh, from an interview, it's expressed in my line or in my stylistic choices. So either way, um, I can insert emotional content into my work. That way. Yeah. Um, Details Magazine sent me to a Burning Man to cover it for the magazine. <laughs> And that was such a difficult assignment because um, I wasn't supposed to do drugs like the whole time. <laughs> and, you know, mostly I was trying to keep my shirt on and, uh, and be, but yet, you know, participate enough. You gotta so get the I, full experience, I, I, man. Yeah, I had to be, like be in it, but then I had to also step back enough to produce a, 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 like a four page piece in a minute. And, uh, and it was, it just was, it was like a clash of those, well, I, but it, you know, it's like a big party that I can't oh, join, wow. you know? And uh, and yet, I did a little. <laughs> <laughs> Just you know, to be fair to the story, you understand. Right. Yeah, I, I don't think I don't think you try to deny your emotions. I, I don't think any of the people on this yeah. uh, uh, at this table or most graphic journalists are not engaged artists. They're involved in their story, and you know we wouldn't be doing this. We're not doing it for the cash. Uh, you know we wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't something that affected us personally and that we didn't care about deeply, I think. Yeah, I think most cartoonists who are doing it have a, a you know, e explicitly political objective. If they're doing political stuff, some people are doing non-political work, but politics kind of dominates um, dominates it. I mean, no one's, no one's, yeah, no one's getting into graphic journalism and trying to be like, I want to write like AP copy, the, the comic <laughs> version. <laughs> um, it's 6.30, so. Uh, could, I, could I just say one last wrap up thing? Um, I, I teach comics and um, and you know running into people who feel like uh, they're not political or they don't like oh I you know I don't do that kind of thing because I'm I'm not political and I wouldn't know what to say and, and all that and I d just describe the association with politics as being like if there was a fire on your sofa and you said I'm not into fire <laughs> it's it's like you you can sit there and you can have no reaction to it and you burn up or you can get a pail with some water and and throw something on it. You may, it may be, you may do it inaccurately. You know, it may have to take a while to get the thing out. You may use fuel. You may, you, you may accidentally <laughs> put lighter fluid on it. But the, the point being that, that you, um, you know, we're all associated with politics, whether we, you know, vote or don't vote. You know, these are all actions that are political. All right, we gotta wrap it up, yeah? Well, or do you have, have a question? I actually have a question. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry, I was trying to wrap you guys up. So, um, yeah. along those lines with like the emotional versus uh, the objective narrative, also one of the dichotomies that I enjoy and like that I find really unique to comics, I suppose, is like the visual versus the the narrative. And so like, or not even, is, is it that separated or is it not? Like how often do you guys find yourself um, writing the story in words or dialogue versus drawing the story for somebody to take and is the emotional impact or is the informational aspect different 
when you do it either way. Your book's pretty text heavy. Why don't you? Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I mean, I'm an editor too, and I've noticed that cartoonists, I always break them down into writers first or artists first, and you can really see most people fall really cleanly into that. You can even see people's sketchbooks, like if they sketch the drawing, and then they think of, they, they tend to be people who come to the words later, and I'm definitely, uh, you know, a writer, and I think of the words first. When I come up with a cartoon idea, I, I write the text first, and then I think of what the picture should be that goes with it. But there's both approaches, or probably hybrid approaches, too. I'm entirely art first. Um, usually I'm on the scene, so I draw the thing before it, it goes away. Like, if there are people talking or if there are people protesting, I only have a few seconds. So I draw what's right there as crudely as it is. And if there's some good quotes, I might even stop the drawing just to, like, write it in the margins, write the quote down in the margins, and I'll, like, clean it up, maybe. And, um, yeah, it's... And before we get wrap up, I just want to make sure everybody knows that we do have books as cartoonists. Chris has some stuff at his table. There's Snowden, Ruins, and then I have a nib anthology that has a bunch of comics journalism and political cartoons in it, including oh, so Chris's uh, piece on masculinity and some cartoons from Ted. 